From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. Argentina has postponed payment on $1.47 billion of its foreign debt, just as a mission from the International Monetary Fund is in Buenos Aires to begin talks on restructuring the country's debt. On Tuesday, protesters urged the government to prioritize food security and social services over paying off the massive $57 billion bailout loan agreed between the IMF and the previous government of Mauricio Macri. More demonstrations are planned this Thursday by trade unions and social movements that support the government's attempts to renegotiate with the IMF. Let the money not go to the International Monetary Fund. Let it actually be a serious plan that will be able to help the poorest sectors. Unanimously, President Alberto Fernandez's law to restructure the $100 billion of foreign debt, and the president toured Europe to gather support. The government says the debt is unpayable in its present form and that the priority is to lift the country out of recession and tackle the legacy of poverty and inequality left by Macri's right-wing administration. Obviously, the case of President Trump, who decided to support Macri in the election because we were, according to what they said, the worst there was in politics. So Trump decided to support him with 57 billion U.S. dollars. But the problem was that the 57 billion wasn't to be used in the reactivation of the economy, but to cover the financial speculation. There has been widespread indignation in El Salvador at Sunday's events when President Nayib Bukele sent soldiers into parliament. The president was trying to push lawmakers to vote for a loan of $109 million intended to strengthen the country's security forces. Criticisms of the military occupation of parliament, ordered by President Nayib Bukele, have come thick and fast from a range of citizen bodies. I think this is the first important defeat for the government of President Bukele. There are now two alternatives. Either the president continues with his aggressive attitude of slandering and attacking people all the time, and that would only deepen the country's problems, or he learns the lesson, which is that he cannot lead an effective government which tackles the country's problems by breaking the constitutional rules. After the Constitutional Court ruled that the president's call for an extraordinary session of parliament to approve his loan was unconstitutional and ordered him not to use the armed forces and the police in this way, members of the assembly also condemned his actions. We have issued a strenuous condemnation of the fact, for example, that the police broke into the parliament's premises by breaking through the gates and jumping over walls. Then the army and the police and the president himself came into the chamber without being invited. Twenty years after the peace accords were signed in El Salvador, the younger generation, who have grown up in democracy and peace, are alarmed by the government's actions. Our people had to struggle for decades to rid themselves of terribly bloody military dictatorships. So we, as young people, have inherited that. And it is our duty to understand where our country came from, to know its history. The fact that we did not live through those atrocities doesn't mean we don't have to understand them. Sunday's events continue to draw criticism at home and abroad. President Nayib Bukele says he will comply with the court's ruling, which forbids him from calling another such extraordinary session of the Legislative Assembly. We now head to the United States. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders has won the New Hampshire Democratic primary. Sanders, who led the polls going into the vote, got 26% of the votes, beating his closest rival, former South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who amassed 24.4%. Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar was a distant third with 19.7%. It was another bad night for former Vice President Joe Biden, who sank to a disastrous fifth place, getting just over 8% of the votes. Now, our campaign is not just about beating Trump. It is about transforming this country. 
It is about having the courage to take on Wall Street, the insurance companies, the drug companies, the fossil fuel industry, the military industrial complex. The trial of four members of the Embassy Protection Collective started on Tuesday in Washington, D.C. They are accused of interfering with the protective functions of the U.S. Department of State. In April 2019, after the Venezuelan government recalled all diplomatic staff from their embassy in Washington, D.C., four members of the collective occupied the building until a protective power agreement could be implemented. Their actions also prevented U.S.-backed opposition forces from taking over the embassy. But on May 16th, the four activists were arrested under the argument that their refusal to leave interfered with the government's ability to protect the embassy. And the Venezuelan opposition lawmaker Juan Guaido got a stormy reception when he returned to Caracas airport on Tuesday. As he came through the baggage hall, Guaido was confronted by a worker from the state-owned airline Conviasa. She called him a traitor for promoting the U.S. sanctions against the airline. And she exited the airport. The self-proclaimed leader met more protests from angry workers. The right wing in Bolivia is doing all it can to, to prevent the country's biggest party, the movement towards socialism, from returning to power in the May elections. Our correspondent, Fede Morales, has more from La Paz. Este miércoles, al final de la tarde, vence el plazo. Wednesday afternoon is the deadline for political parties that are taking part in the May 3rd elections to present the missing documentation for their candidates, according to the Supreme Electoral Court. Things like an address or a cell phone number. The organizations say this is a campaign by the right wing to block the participation of the mass party. Dozens of political figures who were part of the coup are demanding the exclusion of former President Evo Morales after his party presented his candidacy for a seat in the Senate from the state of Cochabamba. The mass party will have to present more documents and deal with these demands and others that are expected to come. The main argument is the requirement for residency in the country. Politicians of the right say that Morales lived for three months in Mexico and Argentina and that presidential candidate Luis Arce has been traveling to Brazil for medical treatment. The Santa Cruz Civic Committee said it will march to La Paz to push this demand with or without arguments. Meanwhile, the legal persecution also continues against the candidates of the mass, like the case of Luis Arce, who was included in a four-year-old case of corruption just hours after he was confirmed as the presidential candidate. Also corresponding in Bolivia. And coming up, an international wrestling competition begins in Cuba by passing U.S. sanctions. Don't go away. The life is full of moments. Moments of fight. Moments of hope. Moments that transcend. Moments that you can live in. Telezur Documentaries. Sundays. Only on Telezur. Welcome back. On Tuesday, the UK government has deported 17 people to Jamaica despite a court of appeal issuing an emergency judgment. Lee Jasper from Black Lawyers for Justice said the deportations were inhumane and an extension of the government's racist anti-immigrant policies. There are some involved in very serious offenses, but the vast majority are not. They are an individual whose last offense uh, was for a small drug offence 17 years ago. There are people on that plane having been deported uh, with sentence with um, their last criminal offence was 20, 23 years ago. Why is it that this government has taken all of that time 
to determine their status. They've not proven to be a threat to the United Kingdom. They've not committed any further offences. And therefore, for all intents and purposes, having arrived here with their Windrush parents, uh, they are indeed British uh, citizens. These deportees uh, uh, had a court order preventing their deportation. And this government took those detainees from their detention centres at the dead of night. Uh, they were shackled from ankle to waist uh, and they were forced, some uh, resisted and were beaten badly onto coaches, transported over 300 miles away from London to a lonely airport and sat on that bus knowing that the court had, had ruled in their favour and this government did all of that to those in detainees and their families while it sought an appeal against that court ruling. I think so. I think Trump and Boris Johnson uh, share a lot in common. And one of them is this uh, uh, almost ideological commitment to identify people of colour, be they Nigerians, be they uh, people from Jamaica, and to double down on them as being unpopular minorities so that they can prove uh, their ideological credentials to uh, people in the country who would support a, a, an apartheid-like uh, culture. Uh, we've got plenty of white Commonwealth individuals here in the United Kingdom, from New Zealand, from Australia, uh, even South Africans, former South African, who have not been subject to this wholesale targeting and deportation. And yet we are asked to believe that this government is operating on the basis of the rule of law. No, that is a lie. What we're seeing is a government that is infected with the culture of racism that is brutally targeting people of Caribbean and African descent. In other news, the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa and the South African Cabin Crew Association have filed an urgent court application to stop retrenchments at South African Airways. Last week, the business rescue practitioners at the struggling airline announced that 11 routes would be cancelled as part of a way to save the cash-strapped airline from shutting down completely. Unions, however, say this will result in the retrenchment of thousands of workers. The difficulty is that when you've got an ailing airline with challenges in terms of meeting some of the short-term targets, with huge pressure in terms of debt repayments, uh, tough decisions have to be made. The consequences of that is obviously that SAA will not need all of the staff uh, that they currently have because they have less routes and obviously less need for different staff in this environment. We expected a radical restructuring and uh, stopping loss-making routes is one of the things that it was an option on the table. We're not that necessarily fussed about the announcement of the routes that are being stopped. What we are quite angry about, however, is announcing uh, retrenchments without actually announcing your business rescue plan, which means um, we're in basically retrenching as a knee-jerk reaction to cash flow, and that's not the way you're going to save this airline. You're not going to retrench yourself into profit. Thousands of residents have fled the town of Manjina in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo after a rise in militia attacks over the past three days. The Ebola hit town of some 72,000 people was left eerily, eerily empty as families migrated to nearby Beni. Residents say they fear the return of the Allied Democratic Forces, which carried out the deadly strike. Attacks by the ADF since last October have also hindered efforts to contain the Ebola virus. In Mexico, the Attorney General has proposed new reforms that include the removal of femicides as a specific kind of crime, causing outrage among feminist organizations. This pink structure located in the middle of Mexico City is known as the Anti-Monument. It has become a meeting point for feminist groups to protest widespread violence against women. They don't understand the pain of mothers who have lost their daughters. It's impossible to explain. 
They just don't understand it. In their last meeting, they commemorated Fatima's death, which remains unpunished. She was 12 years old when three men tortured her, raped her, and killed her in the state of Mexico. We will keep fighting for our daughters, for our mothers and sisters. We will do everything that's possible to bring this to an end. So there are no more deaths. We want all of us to be alive. In this country, almost all femicides stand in impunity. According to the Attorney General, criminal law needs to be reformed so the public ministry can validate the crimes when they are motivated by gender. If the public ministry has a specific capacity to resolve homicides, and if there is a vulnerable group, we need to work within our established parameters. We need to create laws that work within our abilities, not beyond them, because that does not help the victims. However, feminist groups reject the proposal, considering that their years-long struggle will be discarded. The reform seeks to diminish the importance of gender-based violence and to ignore the fact that femicides often end in impunity. This happens due to a lack of proper training and weak due process by certain institutions. In the meantime, mobilizations are accomplished constant on the streets, demanding increased safety and an end to gender-based violence, as according to official numbers, femicides increased by 137% over the last five years. Wrestlers representing 14 countries have gathered in Cuba to compete at an international tournament despite sanctions imposed by the U.S. government. More than 20 competitors will participate this week in the Cerro Pelado Granma International Tournament, representing the U.S., Canada, Honduras, Puerto Rico, Argentina, Chile and Hungary in what is considered a top sport in Cuba. With the newly imposed sanctions by the Trump administration, even competitions such as wrestling have seen a drop in the participation of U.S. athletes. A sport has nothing to do with politics. It is essential that athletes from all countries can fraternize with us, and it is very good. Nothing to talk about politics. A sport is simply something apart. When it comes down to it, sports, is, it gets rid of all that. It's a peaceful thing. It's not political. It's not one government and another government. It's uh, a Cuban athlete versus a USA athlete. We're down here to compete in one of the greatest sports in the world. After this break, 34 patients in Wuhan, China are cured of the coronavirus, now called COVID-19. Stay with us. A review of the world news that investigates, incites analysis and induces criticism, because every event has a context. Pusimos el punto en el. Dot in the eye. Saturdays. Only on the Thank you for joining us again. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has threatened to attack Syrian government forces everywhere if his forces are attacked. Speaking in Ankara, Erdogan said Turkey is determined to push the Syrian army out of northwestern Idlib by the end of February. Tensions have flared up between Damascus and Ankara in the last few weeks, with the former accusing the latter of supporting anti-government rebels. I hereby declare that we will strike regime forces everywhere from now on, regardless of the Yitlib and Sochi deal. If any tiny bit of harm is dealt to our soldiers at observation posts or elsewhere. 
The United Nations Children's Fund, or UNICEF, has warned that tens of thousands of children and civilians in Libya continue to suffer amid the violence and chaos of Libya's long-standing civil war. It's not necessary to have an in-depth knowledge on the impacts of war on civilians to see that one of the most vulnerable groups are children. Since 2014, an armed conflict rages between Marshal Khalifa Haftar, the head of the Libyan National Army, and the unbacked government of National Accord to fill the power vacuum left behind the killing of President Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. And as a result, tens of thousands of children are displaced. The situation for children in Libya is terrible. The conflict has displaced more than 19,000 children since last April, while more than 200,000 children have left their schools during the same time period. This comes as at least 200 schools have been closed across the country, and there seems to be no end in sight to fighting. In early February, the latest and mediated talks between military representatives of Libya's Tripoli-based government and Commander Khalifa Haftar have ended with no breakthrough. Protect their rights, give them health care, give them water and sanitation, and allow them to go back to school, because it all starts with education. Indiscriminate attacks in populated areas have caused hundreds of deaths, and UNICEF has received reports of children being maimed or killed, and many of them are also being recruited to the fighting. There are also 60,000 migrant and refugee children, many of them kept in detention centers. They are often exploited and horribly treated as they become victims of human traffickers. Since the fall of President Muammar Gaddafi in 2011, Libya has been in the throes of ongoing instability and economic collapse despite its large oil reserves. During the latest rounds of talks in Geneva over the first week of February, the two warring factions agreed on the need to expedite the return of internally displaced people, but they didn't reach an agreement on the best ways to achieve that goal. Italy's Senate will on Wednesday vote on whether far-right opposition leader Matteo Salvini should be brought to court for illegally detaining migrants during his time as interior minister. Salvini had refused to allow 116 rescued migrants of the Gregor Gregoretti Coast Guard boat where they had been languishing for about a week in difficult conditions until a deal was reached with other European states to host them. He faces up to 15 years in prison if found guilty. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas told the UN Security Council on Tuesday that the world should reject President Donald Trump's Middle East peace plan, calling it an outside imposition that cannot bring lasting peace. I have come to you on behalf of the 13 million Palestinians to call for a just peace. That is all. I have come to you today, ladies and gentlemen, to reaffirm the Palestinian position that rejects the Israeli-U.S. proposal. This plan will not bring peace or stability to the region, and therefore we will not accept it. We will confront its application on the ground. This is the summary of the project that was presented to us. This is the state that they will give us. It's like a Swiss cheese, really. And ahead of President Abbas's address at the UN, thousands of Palestinian citizens protested in Ramallah, rejecting Trump's plan. They also demanded an end to the Israeli occupation of their lands and respect for Palestinian sovereignty. We came here to support our political leadership, and we say to this unjust world that Palestine, from its river to its sea, is ours. And we tell Trump, his son-in-law, and Netanyahu, that we will stay, no matter how long or short. The death toll from the novel coronavirus, now officially named as COVID-19, has risen to 1,115 in mainland China. Despite public fears that the coronavirus outbreak could scale into a full-blown pandemic, public health experts have called for patience until more details about the virus are known. 
The World Health Organization has convened a two-day global research and innovation forum in Geneva to boost international action against the COVID-19 outbreak. The forum will bring together 400 participants, including leading virologists, representatives of countries with confirmed cases and experts from public health agencies. The event aims to come up with a roadmap for the scientific research against the virus that will include finding out its origin, designing clinical treatments, medicines, public health measures, and eventually a vaccine against the deadly disease. What matters most is stopping the outbreak and saving lives. With your support, that's what we can do together. And it's a test of scientific solidarity. Will the world come together to find shared answers to shared problems? That's why we are here today. On Tuesday, the first batch of 34 patients who got infected with the COVID-19 virus were discharged from three temporary mobile hospitals in the Chinese city of Wuhan. They were discharged after undergoing various tests, including two nucleic acid tests, chest radiographies, blood tests, and being confirmed that they showed no signs of fever. The three temporary medical facilities with multiple functions, such as emergency aid, treatment, and clinical examination services, were set up to admit and patients with mild system, the symptoms of this virus. The release of the first batch of patients from the hospitals has brought a sense of vigor and confidence to the remaining patients. And with that good news, we end our news brief. But you can find all of our stories by checking our website, telesurenglish.net. And be sure to also join us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.